That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Zone of Interest, the fourth film directed by Jonathan Glazer, which premiered in competition at the 2023 Cannes Film Festival, where it won the Grand Jury Prize. A24 is releasing it on December 15th, 2023. Notably, it is based on the novel by Martin Amis, which I believe was published in 2014, who died a year after the film premiered, oh. or a day after the film premiered. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Do I know this director's other films? Yeah. Do you know Birth? Because I had a movie night for it with Nicole Kidman. Where in, the, she, in the bathtub? Where she believes the little boy is the reincarnation of her yes. husband. Yes. Very creepy, Anne Heche. Love, actually, I like all of his films. Uh, Sexy Beast was his debut with Ben Kingsley in an Oscar-nominated performance. Uh, but Under the Skin from 2013, starring Scarlett Johansson, definitely ranks as one of the best films of the last decade. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. This film... The Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Haas, and his wife Hedwig strive to build a dream life for their family in a house and garden next to the camp. Yeah, like a house on top of a portal to hell. What is your pull quote? An incredibly bleak and oblique glance at the horrors of the Holocaust, Glazer minds the terrors of austerity and what feels like an apex in the cinema of cruelty. Mine. The Zone of Interest is a film that's equal parts disturbing and masterful. Yeah, this movie was very upsetting, but in a very uh, eerie way because it's sort of like what we don't see mm -hmm. that's upsetting, but we can hear it and smell it and feel it, but we can't see it. Um, yeah, so if you are, were, are coming out from under a rock somewhere and have never heard of the Holocaust, I, I don't... It's. I'd be interested to hear from someone who has no idea about world history to see what they make of this film because you don't. It reminded me of um, lyrics from that Buffalo Springfield song for what it's worth. Like uh, something's happening here. What it is, it ain't exactly clear. Yeah, that's interesting. If a person somehow didn't know about the Holocaust and watched this film, what would they think is happening? Because so the story is that this commandant he is running Auschwitz and he lives in this beautiful picturesque home with a beautiful garden literally like next to the camp like his front door is like next to the gate to enter the camp and he's there with his family and they're just living life like most of the movie is them just getting along like you know normal things the wife's mother comes to visit then we find out that the commandant is being transferred to another camp. He, he's and, going back to Oranienburg in Berlin. And I thought the most wild scene in this movie was when the wife is like, I'm not leaving my home. I'm going to raise my family here. You can go, but I'm staying. Mm -hmm. Which is so crazy to think that right next door are people who are ripped from their homes and families. And she's standing there like, I'm not leaving. I'm not going to leave. So, but, and it's funny because that comes... This is happening in the background, and uh, the wife, Hedvig, doesn't know about it yet, but she's been bragging to her mother that, oh, my husband calls me the queen of Auschwitz. There, there are a lot of little things happen, but we see the commandant preparing to transfer. He ultimately does. And then we see that he's being uh, given recognition for developing a new technique with the gas chambers mm -hmm. so that they can kill Jewish people more quickly and efficiently the end then the final scene is we get like it, it's because this is obviously set during that time but then at the end we see in modern time uh like a cleaning crew at auschwitz which is now a museum and they're just cleaning and then the film ends mm -hmm. yeah uh and also notably there are a couple um instances where we change to the perspective of a young german girl who's it seems like she's sneaking out of her house at night to do some interesting rituals and along the way picks up uh, a piece of music and plays it at home written by somebody that died in the camps. Well, let's talk about that first, I guess. So the that girl's shot, like then the film switches to what looks like, like exposure filter. Mm -hmm. And I thought she kind of looked like Little Red Riding Hood at first. And it looks like she's putting app... What I thought this girl was doing is that she knew what was happening at the camps and she was trying to put food mm -hmm. for maybe 
people who were able to escape the camps, they'd have something to eat. Well, also... Or am I totally off? No, no. Oh. I think there's uh, multiple ways to kind of interpret, because it's not really clear what she's doing. Um, and I've seen this film three times now. Uh, I saw it twice at Cannes because I think I was so... I felt so out of it watching the first time I was able to see a second screening the day after. Uh, but both of those scenes, the, those exposed scenes with this girl, uh, are set to Rudolph reading bedtime fairy tale stories to his kids. And the second one I being, I, I believe, is Hansel and Gretel. You know, the trail, right. the trail of breadcrumbs. That's and, right. So I think there's a whole lot to kind of unpack visually that is going, and, and the sound design of this film, which has him returning to work with composer uh, Mika L Levi, who scored Under the Skin and things like Jackie and, um, I'm thinking, uh, Zola. Well, that's my next note. The sound editing. If, if this movie doesn't win an Academy Award, I don't know. Cause, or at least get nominated for sound editing. Because you hear in the... Like when we're in this beautiful house and we see like the kids playing or the, you know, the people in the kitchen cooking. And then you hear gunshots just randomly. You hear people screaming. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And then as they start to... Uh accelerate the burning of uh, the Jews, how the smell uh, affects them. It, and it's like the family has been acclimated to this environment. But when, I think a really interesting scene is when the mother visits and she wakes up in the middle of the night to see... She her, sees like flames, burning, smoke. And she leaves in the middle of the... She leaves before everybody else wakes up without saying anything to her daughter. So I didn't know much about this movie. I knew that it was... I, I, I knew that it was a like a story set near a concentration camp, but I did not expect this. And so at first, when we meet the wife... I, Played I, by the great Sandra Hewler. I was thinking, is she fully aware of what's going on? And then one of the first scenes is we see that her husband has brought her a fur coat. But then the fur coat's like in a bag. She He hasn't brought him to her. Uh, one of the uh, men from the camp wheels it in a wheelbarrow so then immediately i'm like oh well this is not like a proper gift this is like probably taken from someone who was taken to the camp and so then i'm like she does know what's going on and then when she reaches her hand in the pocket she pulls out some lipstick and it's like inconsequential to her right she, she keeps it she keeps it she actually puts it on which was super creepy to me and then she searches the lining which i assumed because sometimes people get like their names embroidered into the so it's like, oh, she does know what's going on. There's in, there's it's another creepy moment involving that coat because she know she finds a picture of the woman in some magazine that was wearing it, and shows it to her friends. But all the little things that are happening, like when the husband, the commandant, comes home, and he has to like, you know how like in Minnesota you have the mud room. He kind of has the room outside of the door of the house to like rinse the blood off his shoes mm -hmm. and he just does it like it's nothing and all of the it's rated pg-13 because you're not you don't actually see anything but you, you hear it that's what's even more creepy yeah. is this movie's rated pg-13 and i was horrified then the there's a scene where it the the women are in the kitchen mm -hmm. and they're like gossiping like just regular ladies talk and the men are next in the room next door and they're discussing the commandant's new technique mm -hmm. of how to, like they're literally talking about how to burn more people faster and how to, and just that, like the way it's shot. I also really um, like the cinematography. Oh, Lukasz Zal, a Polish cinematographer who's worked a lot with Pawel Polakowski, notably in films like uh, Cold War and um, uh, uh, Ida. Because it's beautiful, like this home they live in and the, and the garden, but a lot of shots are like you can see the camp in the background or it's, it's just ever present. So even in this beautiful house that's like meticulously kept, there's like this darkness over it. Mm -hmm. Like it kind of feels muted. And there's, this, there's a one moment in particular where the film kind of, it's like the film disintegrates and turns red, kind of like you ripped a piece of skin off of something and see this. The, the bloodiness underneath. There's a scene where it's the, it's the commandant's birthday and all the little soldiers are like greeting him. And and while that's happening, you see that the shot changes so we can't see the camp. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, it's right there. Oh, when she's giving one of the creepiest scenes and a, a phrase that stuck sticks with me is when she's showing her garden off to the mother. And the, 
Oh, we're growing kohlrabi and the children love the kohlrabi. Yeah, she has this like meticulous garden with all these different uh, vegetables and yeah, like so particular. Well, related to that, there's a moment when the commandant is on the phone like arguing with someone about how they're taking care of the lilac bushes. Like... Right, he wants a memo. The lilac bushes are for everyone to enjoy. Don't destroy them. I mean, it's just... I, the irony is, you know, supposed to... It is apparent. You already mentioned it, but there's a scene where he and his family are like in the nearby like creek or river and he's fishing, the kids are swimming. And he, I think, steps on something and picks it up. And it's like human remains. Looks like, like a, a job. I think it's like a mandible. Mm -hmm. And so he freaks out and then he grabs the kids, like get out of the water. And then we see that like he's ingested some of the water and there's like uh, ashes or soot. And so he's sick and then the kids are like, being washed off and yeah it's just so upsetting i think it's also worth noting that amos's novel doesn't name anybody and so uh glazer is taking quite a departure by centering this on a real life person rudolph haas played by christian friedel when you we see them bathing like they're out of like a family picnic in the beginning you see him in his bathing suit and it's like oh so the, this is the master race okay uh but yeah, he's not well i should say he's not well yeah he's fine but in, and i've seen that actor in other things and he it's just an interesting shot because it's so unflattering and it's like and i think all of that is on very much on purpose so there were a couple things i wasn't sure about um the significance so we see that the captain is having like an extramarital affair or at the bare mm. minimum he's having sex with another woman and his wife I'm assuming he doesn't want her to know because we see him come home and wash his penis off. What do you think the significance of that is? Oh, I think he was using he was using a, a Jewish woman in the camp to do... Oh, so you do think that lady we saw was Jewish? Yes, oh, definitely. Wow. Because also, if you read about Rudolf Haas, he, uh, there was a report of him doing that, in, oh. which might explain why he was transferred at this certain <laughs> point in time. And this woman lived, she survived, and she testified, uh, and... Uh, she was pregnant by him and had an abortion oh, wow. in 1943. So th there's a there's a whole lot of things that Glazer is kind of hinting at about this particular person. But there's something else that's present throughout the film, which is their dog. This dog is every damn I noticed in every that, scene of the movie. There, there's this dog running around. And I know I commented on it because I noticed that more than ever watching it again. And we were trying to figure out why that could be. And I think the dog was something from their previous lives and something, I, I think these people are no longer able to love or have affection or care for anything anymore. And this dog, this dog is a reminder of that and is clearly anxious and always looking for attention. Yeah, that would, that thought makes the most sense to me. Because it's, it feels like it's around a lot. It, no, it is. And it's kind of a nuisance. And even in scenes where it's like, I mean, it's just so random that you just see the dog like kind of like zip by or run in circles and move on. Or there are scenes when like you walk past like the, like a, a table in the garden and you see the dog in the corner, like grabbing a piece of food. And so, yeah, I I, I wonder if that was intended to be like, symbolic of the life before they entered this hellscape right that they they clearly don't want to leave I or mean, acknowledge and you yeah. it, the way glazer has crafted this i mean this is clearly an exemplification of the phrase that was coined by hannah arendt uh, the banality of evil which was in reference to adolf eichmann but if you read about haas he said a lot of the same things that eichmann did that clearly he was just a cog in the wheels of this machine and uh, really couldn't be blamed for everything that happened. What do you think about the the final scene in the museum being and being and being cleaned? Well, it's interesting because that's juxtaposed with a picture of him leaving that building in the in Oranienburg, and he's he's sick. He's throwing up. He's retching in the hallway, and we've we've switched to these women cleaning this and. Um, I, d I don't know entirely sure, but I would guess that it has something to do with that the, he's disintegrating from the outside. And, you know, I, I like how there's this wetness, this retching sound that is uh, compared to this kind of just very leisurely dry sweeping in, the, in modern day and just the... Uh, to weigh in on the terrible things that happened. But I thought it meant, I mean, mine's more basic, but I just thought it meant that this is history. Like, yeah, like, yes. Like, 
which in some ways it's not, but like, you know, this specific scenario is history. But yeah, this movie was, I mean, it's very well crafted. Yes, uh, but, but it also is cold. It's very off-putting. I think that we've also become accustomed to seeing films about the Holocaust and other major uh, events and terrible, horrific events that humans exact upon each other in the world in a certain way uh, where we're granted some sort of catharsis. And this is really about those who were complicit, like willingly complicit. and. Uh, I think sitting with it, to me, experiencing this film, it's almost like watching cancer take hold of a body. The way I felt watching this is how I felt watching The White Ribbon. Yeah, very, and Haneke talking about austerity, is he's an expert at that. What would you give The Zone of Interest? And I think it's also interesting, you know, it clearly going beyond this film and this person, but they tried hiding and disguising their identities, this family, after the war. You mean the real commandant? The real, the real commandant and his wife. I hated Sandra Hewler's hair in this, by the way, and I think it's on purpose, but I, I hate it. And I love that actor, but... I'm assuming it's of the time. Anyway. Yes, but it's... I mean, it is ugly. <laughs> it's, it's just like... Uh, um, but he... She looks like if you mi mix, like, Princess Leia with, like, Ginger Spice or Scary Spice. Or oh, yeah, it's, it's awful. Oh, it's uh, but he adopted the pseudonym Fritz Lang when, oh. when, <laughs> when he when was he trying to hide his hiding. identity. Oh, and I think it's also interesting that we're recording this on Pearl Harbor Day. Oh. But, what would you give this movie? Uh, four and a half. I would give this film... Oh, I guess I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> oh, my God. I think I would give it... Four and a half out of five. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.